Well, it's great to see every one of you tonight, and um, we are going to have a special night um, for this hour-long uh, service, Good Friday service. So I want to read a passage of Scripture, a very familiar passage of Scripture, from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. It has to do with what we will be doing at the end of our time, uh, the, really the, the culmination of our time together, uh, and that will be celebrating the Lord's Supper. So I want to read uh, briefly from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Listen to the, to the words, let your heart be stirred so that when we come to receive the elements, you'll be thinking about the broken body and the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to follow along, this passage is found in 1 Corinthians 11, and I'm going to begin with verse 23 and just read several verses. Paul said, I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, I'm so grateful that as the people of God, we can celebrate not what we do for you, especially this evening, this evening, but what you have done for us. We thank you that we can walk through the elements, the uh, events of the Passion Week, that we can culminate with your going to the cross on our behalf. And Lord, help us to think deeply about that. I, I'm not asking that you give us a flurry of emotions necessarily, but I'm asking you to press the truth of your word about your death for our sins into our hearts. And may it change our lives, not just this evening, but from here on out until you come back or until we go to meet you. So Lord, uh, help us, we pray. Bless us during this time. We believe that you will. Give us open ears, uh, eyes to see, and a heart to hear. And we will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Stand and sing with us as we proclaim the beauty of our King.
Stop. 
for seizing control, for scorning our very maker. In thought, word, and deed, we failed in our King. How deeply we need a Savior. famous chapter in Isaiah, Isaiah 53. Just follow along as I read aloud. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no former majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off, out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked. And with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Sing this old hymn, Stricken, Smitten, and Afflicted. Stricken, smitten, and afflicted, see him dying on the tree. Tis the Christ by men rejected, yes, my soul, tis he, tis he. Tis the long-expected prophet, David's son, yet David's Lord, by his son God. Spoken, tis the true and faithful word. You tell me, ye who hear him groaning, was there ever? 
Strength through fear is cause this only falls and salt in his distress. Many hands raised to bring him, no would interpose to save. But the deepest stroke that pierced him was the stroke that justice gave. Sin but lightly, nor suppose the evil great. Here may view its nature rightly, here its guilt may estimate. Mark the sacrifice appointed, see who bears the awful load. Tis the word the Lord anointed. Son of man and Son of God. Here we have a firm foundation, here the refuge of the lost. Christ the rock of our salvation is the name of 
Great job, Jonathan. I messed up. I did read, but when he hesitated, I thought he was skipping the song. But he wasn't. So glad that he didn't. If you are a regular with us, and most of you are, I know that we have several guests. We're glad to have you with us tonight. You will know that we always try our best, I always try my best, to, during liturgical seasons, to stay with what we are preaching through at that particular time. We normally try to take a book, preach through it, and so when we come to a season like this, I don't try to force it, but I do try to see if there is anything in there knowing that all of the Scripture points to Jesus ultimately. So to see if there is anything within what we are studying that has to do with what we are looking at at this particular season of the year, Easter. And, you know, through the years, I have never, ever been disappointed. Several years ago, we were preaching through the book of Ruth, one of the richest books for Christmas that you could ever preach through, and it just fit. And so here we are uh, celebrating not only the triumphal entry this last Sunday, but also Palm, Su or, uh, Palm Sunday it was, and now Good Friday, and then Resurrection Sunday. And we're still in Nehemiah chapter 3, the story of the gates, as we've been walking through Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah. And now for several weeks in chapter 3, the story of Nehemiah rebuilding the walls and the gates around the holy city, Jerusalem. Now, you're going to have a lot of visuals tonight because I see this fitting together from what we talked about last Sunday and into tonight with the eastern gate. And if you will remember with me, I didn't do the handouts tonight. I know most of you can't see that, but I just want you to see what we've been doing. Up at the top, in the northeast corner of Old Jerusalem, where Nehemiah was rebuilding the gates, we started with the sheep gate. We came around the fish gate, the old gate, the valley gate, the dung gate. We did that all in one week. Then we came back last week to turn the corner, go to the fountain gate, the water gate, the horse gate, and end up talking about the east gate for the triumphal entry. Now, I want to pull this in so that you can see it a, a little bit better. Tonight, we're going to be talking, finishing what we started about the east gate. And then, the Lord willing, this coming Lord's Day, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday morning, uh, we're going to finish with the inspection gate. Truly really one of the best. I, I've had more enjoyment preparing this sermon for Easter Sunday than, than I've had in a long time. So I'm, I'm looking forward to it. I'm looking forward to tonight. Now, here's the main point, okay? I know most of you pretty well. So I know you fit into this former category. But if there's anyone who is in the latter category that I'm going to mention, I want to make sure tonight that I am appealing to you to get into that former category. There are only two places to be on this map. There are only two places to be in your life. You need to be in the place where the presence of God is. In His presence, and that's sim uh, symbolically, that's the temple, His divine presence. The nations were outside. You will see Sunday they will come under condemnation. The main point that I've been trying to make, I, I hope strongly, is that you want to be definitely in the presence of God. You want to be in the circle, not out of the circle. Now, last Sunday, we began looking at the eastern gate. It was the one that Jesus, as the Messiah, and as the king made his triumphal entry through that eastern gate into the holy city and into the temple. I, I hate to even say it, but, but I need to. This was not accident. This was not coincidence. This was nothing less than the fulfillment, get this, of prophecy 
that happened 500 years before, around the time of Nehemiah. And these things are marvelous. Uh, You know, there are a lot of people who just don't believe that the fulfilling of prophecy takes place in Scripture, and it does. And it's so beautiful when it does. Let me just go back and remind you. What was the prophecy that signaled, that pointed to a time 500 years later when someone would come through the eastern gate? Then he led me to the gate. The gate facing east. Now remember, this is Ezekiel around the time of the building of the walls and the gates. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel. I wonder who that could be, the glory of the God of Israel. Hmm. We'll see a psalm that speaks of that very specifically. The glory of the God of Israel was coming from the east. Now, for those of you who've never been to the Holy Lands, you, you don't really have a picture for this. We're going to show. We're going to give you a picture so that you can visualize this. All of this is so important. The glory of the Lord, I wonder who that was, entered the temple by the gate that was facing east. East. I wonder which gate that was. Nehemiah's gate, the eastern gate. Oh, but it gets better. Look at this very specific prophecy. We saw this last Sunday, but I want to bring it back to your memories. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. How much more specifically could you get than this? Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. I wonder who that could be. Righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Now, let me ask you a question. Could any other man have fit this bill? Let me ask it this way. Could any other man have sat on that donkey? Wait a minute. You're telling me that no other man, I couldn't? You couldn't? Muhammad couldn't? Buddha couldn't? None of those people, well, maybe they could have sat on a donkey, but they could never have been proclaimed the king that's coming to you, righteous and having salvation. That is so specific. And that one is the one who was riding on the donkey. No one but the king can bring salvation. Now, here's what I want to jump to for tonight. I said we're finishing the eastern gate. And yes, this has something to do with Good Friday and with our partaking of the Lord's Supper together. Ezekiel made another prophecy that has yet to be fulfilled, and it has to do with the eastern gate. In Ezekiel chapter 44, verses 1 and 2, then he brought me back. Now, now, Earlier on, it's saying the, the, the man of the angel of the Lord is giving all of these visions in the night. And so they're, they're just jumbled up, but this comes after. And this has not yet been fulfilled. Watch how specific this is and what has happened in history. Then he brought me back to the outer gate of the sanctuary, which faces east. Hmm. It's yet future, so I wonder what that pertains to. And it was shut. You got that? And the Lord said to me, this gate shall remain shut. It shall not be opened. And no one shall enter by it. For the Lord, the God of Israel, has entered by it. I wonder who that might be. Therefore, it shall remain shut until someone comes to walk through it. The only the prince may sit in it to eat bread before the Lord. He shall enter by the way of the vestibule of the gate and shall go out by the same way. Let me give you a little bit of history, and then we're going to walk through Passion Week. Most of you know what happened in 70 A.D. 
Titus and the Roman legions came according to the prophecy of Jesus. And he said in the temple area, not one stone would remain on another. It was horrible. He was at least in part the abomination of desolation. He came and he destroyed Jerusalem. All the gates were burned. Not necessarily the stones removed off of top of each other, but they were burned. They were destroyed. The wall was torn down and it was destroyed, 70 AD. And for the next 700 years or so, it remained like that. And along about the 6th or 7th century AD, after Nehemiah came along and had rebuilt the walls, they had been destroyed, the 6th or 7th century AD, they were rebuilt, the gates were rebuilt by the Byzantines. And then a guy came along by the name of Suleiman the Magnificent. He was an Ottoman ruler, and in 1544, the dating of this is incredibly precise, he shut the eastern gate. Now, you read the history, and you'll find that, that mainstream secular history doesn't say a lot about it. It'll mention it. But there are credible legends that Suleiman had heard of, you, you know that Muslims, they do read sometimes the Old Testament, but he was familiar with the prophecies of the Messiah coming back through the eastern gate. So, to prevent that, he walled the eastern gate with 16 feet of concrete, of mortar. I know what you're thinking. 16 feet of concrete is going to keep the Messiah out? Well, not only that, he also did something very, very interesting. He also put right outside of the gate a Muslim cemetery because he had it on good authority that no Jewish holy man would ever walk across a Muslim cemetery. Let me just show you a little bit of that. I know for some of you sitting in the back, you'll be wishing that you were front row Baptist right now. <laughs> hey, by the way, if you want this PowerPoint, let me know. I'll send it to you. I think, I think this is absolutely fascinating. You know what this is? Yes, it's the East Gate. The East Gate built by the Byzantines, um, 6th, 7th century A.D., and you see the two porticos, the two openings right there. Now, do you see right below it, those of you who are closer, you can see a black fence around there that's there for a reason. And then you can see the Arab, the Muslim cemetery, right outside of that. And that's what Suleiman did when he he sealed off the gates. Now, I want to back away from... Oh, let me tell you this story. This is an incredible story. 1969, I mentioned this a minute ago to talk about Nehemiah's gates being burned and at least partially torn down in the siege of Titus and the Roman legions. 1969, a young archaeologist named James Fleming still alive, Dr. James Fleming, still an archaeologist, was photographing outside of the eastern wall. The fence was not there. It had been raining. And he stepped back, stepped on loosened soil, and began to slide down. Now, this is something that almost sounds straight out of an uh, Indiana Jones movie, okay? Really, it does. He slid down about 12 or 15 feet, landed, realized that he was intact, he was okay, and through the light that was coming through the hole that had been made, he saw himself knee-deep in human bones. He was in a tomb. And when his eyes adjusted enough, I have no idea what, what all was going through his mind at that time. When his eyes adjusted, he began to look at the wall directly below the gate that had been built that is standing even today that's been sealed over, and he saw the arches, the stones set in an arch, 
And he thought, could this be Nehemiah's gate? He got out of the hole, and he came back the next day, and guess what? The authorities had sealed it off. He was never able to go back down there again. But it's a fascinating story of the reality. Now, we don't know which gate it is that the Lord is going to be coming through. Again, will it be the top one or the bottom one? They're both sealed off. But my friends, I do not think that a sealed gate or a Muslim boneyard, you know what? When the Lord comes back, a revival is likely to break out in that boneyard. It's, it's happened before in the Bible. Now, this is a panoramic view. I, 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 I hesitated to put it up, but I'll show you a little bit of what is on here. This is a, it looks like boxcars. This is a Jewish cemetery right here. Guess what this is? The Garden of Gethsemane. Guess what this is? The Eastern Gate. Guess what this is? The Temple Mount. That's the Dome of the Rock. Holiest location to the Muslim world. And so let's talk about a little bit now. We, we get the east and the west. This is, this is, the gate is facing east. Do you see it again? It's facing east. Mount of Olives right here. And then we walk down from here. So let's go back and talk about Passion Week. All right? What happened on those days? Last Sunday, as we told you, the triumphal entry took place. Jesus and his disciples entered into Jerusalem to great fanfare. But they came out again. Guess which gate they came through? I, I was amazed at how much uh, the, the East Gate plays in the whole Passion Week. They came through the East Gate. They went over the Mount of Olives, uh, less than two miles to Bethany, and they spent the night there, probably with Lazarus, Mary, and Martha. On Monday, Jesus and his disciples again traveled from Bethany over the Mount of Olives, right there. If I can get it, right there down through Gethsemane, through the east gate, and the temple would have been right there. It was huge. This was bigger than the temple that Nehemiah built. This was Herod's temple, and so it was a huge affair, and so they went into it. Now, if you remember on Monday, Jesus also saw a fruitless fig tree. You remember that? And he cursed it, and then he cleansed the temple. And they again exited through the east gate, on their way to spend the night in Bethany. On Tuesday, they would have taken the same route, both in and out of Jerusalem. Jesus confronted the scribes and the Pharisees. It was probably during this time, we don't know for sure, but it's indicated that sometime on Tuesday, Judas decided to betray. Satan filled him. Judas decided to betray. He conspired with the Sanhedrin to betray Jesus. And that afternoon, we know that Jesus stopped with his disciples on the Mount of Olives and spoke of his second coming. Nothing is recorded uh, regarding Jesus' activities on Wednesday. It's probable that he just hung out with the disciples in, in, on Bethany. And then Thursday. Thursday came. Now, we, we have done Thursday services. We call them Monday, Thursday services. This is when Jesus and his disciples entered into Jerusalem. They celebrated the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, together. Later, they would travel out to the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's draw this in just a little bit more so you can get an angle. There's the east gate. Do you see it? There's the garden. So they're in Jerusalem. They, they, they withdraw out to the Garden of Gethsemane, where that night some of the disciples would get sleepy and fall asleep, would not watch with the Lord Jesus. Judas would betray Jesus. He would be arrested. And during that night, he would be tried. Then on Friday, on Friday, here's a close-up of it where you can really see the cemetery that's outside. You can see the east gate. Now, remember, you can see some ruins back here, but all of this would have been the huge temple that Herod had built. On Friday, a lot happened. Very early at the beginning of the day, Judas felt deep remorse. Instead of repenting, he went out and hanged himself. 
Jesus' trial took place somewhere between nine and noon. And he would not pass through the eastern gate again. But he would be led out to Golgotha, carrying his cross through the sheep gate. Now, I'm going to show you this because there, there is a debate about this. But th- this, this is what I believe. And there are two basic places that in Christendom are, are held to be the place of Golgotha. Right outside the old gate and there from the temple is a thing called the Via Della Rosa. Have you heard of that? The way of sorrows, and, and that is held to primarily, it's the traditional. It's held to primarily by Catholics and Orthodox. And they believe Golgotha happened right outside the old gate. It's well within the city now, but it was outside the gates then. So it has some validity. But when you start putting some things together, the psalmist said that he could hear what people were saying from the gate and also the proximity of where he was in carrying his cross Simon of Cyrene being employed to help him. He was crucified at noon, and I believe that it is valid that he went out the sheep gate. That's where we started, the sheep gate, the place where the the Passover lamb would come to be sacrificed. And Jesus carried his cross. Golgotha was right outside the sheep gate. Now, let me show you a picture of the sheep gate. It's called the lion's gate. It's still there. The lion's gate today. That is the church of the Holy Sepulcher. Again, that is held by Christians from uh, throughout the world as being the place of Golgotha. This is Golgotha to them. Now, if you go back, you're you're not going to see much of a hill. There there are just some things that, in my mind, militate against it. I'm okay with it. Uh, I've seen it. You you have to dig. You have to dip down to go inside, but you'll see the rocks on either side in the place where they call Golgotha, where Jesus was crucified. In the late 1800s, a man was visiting, an archaeologist, was visiting Horatio and Anna Stafford. Spafford, does that ring a bell to anybody? It is well with my soul. They were missionaries there. And he began to look and he began to see that over here was a hill right outside of the Sheep Gate. Now, I know it's been 2,000 years and there's all kinds of debate about that. But it strangely resembled a man's skull. Where was Jesus crucified? The place of the skull. And lo and behold, there was a tomb just around the corner, which we believe, and this is called, by the way, Gordon's Calvary. We believe that that is the most accurate place where he was crucified, just outside the sheep gate. Again, why? Because it was through this this gate that the sheep came to be the sacrifice for the Passover and through which Jesus would go, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. It's interesting that if you put this, if you go back to the map, those standing right outside of this gate, those standing on Golgotha could look inside the temple and see when Jesus died, the veil being torn in two from top to bottom. Now, here's the key. Here's the key. The key is not the place. The key is the person. And it was Jesus Christ who made that way so that we could get into God's presence. I mentioned a psalm a minute ago. It's one of my favorite psalms. And for years, even though it was one of my favorites, I struggled deeply with it. And here's why. Maybe you've struggled with it. Because it was always presented to me as this is about me. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Don't we want to be in his presence? That's the point. So who wants to go into the, the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? Well, let me give you the requirements. And I always 
said, okay, this is what I've got to do. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, not on my best day do I have clean hands and a totally pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. And all of a sudden we begin to see that if that psalm is about us, then we are in big trouble because we will never ascend the holy hill of the Lord. We will never stand in his holy place. But there's one who passed through the gate and who will pass through the gate. And we will see this some more on Sunday morning, Resurrection Sunday morning. This is why the psalmist gets excited, and so should we this Good Friday evening. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. And all tonight I've been asking, who is that? Who is this guy? Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. And it is only because of Jesus that we can go in to his presence. I have the, the incredible privilege of not only preaching to you, I have the incredible privilege of working with an awesome group of third and fourth graders on Wednesday night. I see some of them here, Evely, Matthias, we're, okay, and Isaiah, and who did I see a minute ago? They're, they're, uh, yeah, I, I, raise your hand if you're in the third and fourth grade of one group. Okay. Now, I told a story, crazy, crazy story a couple of weeks ago about a guy by the name of Charles Blondin. You ever heard of Charles Blondin? He was the guy from France that, that, that put a tightrope across Niagara Falls. It's a true story. And he walked back and forth. This guy, in fact, he did it so much that people got bored. They, they really did. And he would walk across it. He walked across it blindfold. He walked across it, across it with a wheelbarrow. He walked across it, get this, with a stove that he balanced on one leg and cooked an omelet on it. I'm serious. He really did that. And everybody would cheer and say, oh, you are so great. You can do. We know. And so he got over to the side with all of the crowd and he said, okay, how many of you believe I can do that? Yeah, we all believe you can do it. How many of you will get on my back and let me carry you across? Remember that, kids? There was only one guy that his manager got on his back and he carried him across. Listen. There is a difference, I said this Sunday, between just believing facts. I, oh, yes, Lord, I believe you can save me. And putting your trust so that you climb onto his, as it were, his back. And that he carries you up that holy hill into the presence of God. And the first part of what he did to create that possibility for us is that he went to the cross. And he died on the cross. He didn't just die on the cross. He gave his life on the cross. I want you to take this little kit that you've been given. Uh, if you did not get one, please raise your hand. I know Jerry is back there. Uh, Josh has some more. There are several hands. If you did not get one and you want to partake of the Lord's Supper with us, We're not going to say a lot during this. The elements really say everything that need, needs to be said. What we need to do is to meditate deeply on the meaning of the elements for us. This looks to the death of Christ. It also looks ahead to what happens on Sunday with his resurrection. This is the blood of the new covenant. The old covenant could never erase sins, no matter what. They were a remembrance. And did you hear what I read a few moments ago? There is a time limit to the, short, to the Lord's Supper. We remember the Lord's death until He comes. 
but we do remember his death. And so what I want to do is to pray and to look to Scripture, to read Scripture, and for us to take the elements, the bread that represents the broken body of Christ. Father, I thank you for the fact that you, being fully God, became fully man. You died Calvary's cross. You took the weight of the sins of the world upon yourself so that sinners like me, sinners like the, the ones assembled here, could know you and, and through that broken body could have wholeness of body and mind and spirit, no matter what condition our bodies are in, but we could have that until we go to meet you or you come back. So, Father, as we remember your broken body, I pray that you would help us. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, take that, please, with the wafer up. Peel that back, if you would, and hold onto that wafer. Matthew's gospel says, now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body. Father, it's by faith uh, that we receive the grace given to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. We realize that even that faith is a gift. We can't work it up. We can't get it from our parents. We can't get it from our Awana teachers or our Sunday school teachers or from the preacher. Lord, it is a gift from you. And it is my prayer, our prayer together, that that gift of faith would be granted to those who need to know you tonight, those in our family circle, those in our church circle, our acquaintance circle, our work circle, all the rest, Lord, that you would grant them that they might see that what we're doing tonight is more than a, uh, an empty, meaningless ritual. It is a time when we symbolically say that we are putting our entire trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ and his finished work on the cross. Thank you, Lord, that one drop of blood would be good to save every man, woman, and child. Thank you that you gave it freely and that we receive this symbol of your blood with grateful hearts. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, turn this over and carefully remove that top. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Further states that they sang a hymn, they went out to Gethsemane. And you've seen the picture of that. To do battle, to pray, and to get ready for Christ going to the cross. So we're going to sing a hymn, and then after that, uh, you will be dismissed. Stand and sing once more. King of glory. Oh, lift your eyes to heaven, see the Holy One eternal. Behold the Lord of majesty. 
exalted in his temple as symphonies of angels praise now strength to sound his glory come worship fall before his grace the king in all his beauty